Well, welcome everyone to Advanced Sectional Matrix Techniques with Dr. Derek Draft, our guest presenter here this evening. And I see we've already got one question asking where in the U.S. are we? Well, we are in the beautiful metropolis of Spring Lake, Michigan. We are up to, I think, uh, two stoplights, maybe three now. We're pretty proud of that. And it has been raining here for the past, well, pretty close to 60 hours now. <laughs> Setting records. <laughs> yes. Dr. Draft was kind enough to drive, and he had about a half hour drive to get to us here this evening in uh, what can only be described as wonderful Michigan weather. So we appreciate uh, him joining us here this evening. So, but before we get started, we're going to just talk uh, through just a couple of quick things here. Uh, tonight, um, we're going to be talking about some more advanced sectional matrix techniques. We're not going to be covering um, too many of the basics about, you know, how to put a ring on or how to pick a matrix band or a wedge. Um, a lot of those topics we have covered in our basic sectional matrix technique course, which is already out on our learning center at garrisondental.com. You can uh, watch a recorded version of that, and, and that will be something that we probably will offer again here before too long. In fact, uh, tomorrow, starting at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, running all afternoon, so you can join any time that's convenient for you, um, I will be doing some of those basic techniques in kind of a lunch and learn format. You can jump on whenever you want. Um, I'll see uh, when you jump on there, uh, be able to uh, recognize that you're there with me, and uh, we can talk about whatever Garrison product you'd like to take a look at, and we'll walk through some of the te techniques. Uh, the link to uh, sign up for that is out on the website in the Learning Center. It's the very first section, Lunch and Learn. So, um, so this evening, we're going to talk about some of the more complicated techniques, dealing with uh, extremely wide preps. Those can be a real challenge. Um, and then we're going to, we, we almost, every time we have a webinar, we have a lot of questions about how to do back-to-back -back restorations. Those can be uh, particularly challenging, and Dr. Draft here has got uh, uh, the skilled hands to show us how it's done. So, And then when we close out, uh, we'll have ample time. We should have maybe 15 or 20 minutes to be able to answer your questions. So if you can uh, type those in, in the question box as we go through this evening, as you think of them, uh, when we get to the end, uh, our, our technical operator, Kendall, will go through those questions and, and we'll get those answered for you this evening. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Derek Draft. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you uh, for Garrison Dental having me here this evening to help out and hopefully teach all our listeners out there some finer points about how to use the Garrison products. So, you know, I was at your office the other day yes. and you have something kind of unique uh, Running around the ceiling of your office. Tell us Correct. a little bit about that. Correct. Um, one of the things I attribute to getting me into dentistry was actually the love of model trains and building model trains. So I have carried forward that love into my office and actually have a uh, Lionel-sized train running around the ceiling of uh, my office through the operatories and through the waiting room. Yeah, I thought that was really cool how it wasn't just in the waiting room, but it wound back and forth yep. around through the different operatories yep. and... I'm sure that uh, the younger patients and, and the older alike probably yes. really appreciate Kids of all that. ages. So, and, I, <laughs> and I always say I get to bring my toys to work. What better fun is that to be able to bring in? Actually, some of the cars you saw were from when I was a kid. Yeah, some, of the, that's, some of the cars I still have. So That's fantastic. Yeah. It's a great way to learn patience and, and certainly uh, manipulating those itty-bitty yes. little parts. The fine so, details. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, uh, Dr. Draft is just from a few miles away from here over in Granville, Michigan. He's been private practice there for the last 20 years. Um, and now, how did you get involved with the forensic dentistry yes. in Kalamazoo? Well, I've been a forensic dentist probably since about the year 2000. I joined the state of Michigan team, and I also then joined the federal team called DMORT. Um, so I was doing forensics there, but more recently, I'm working towards becoming a board-certified forensic dentist. In order to become that, I needed to have a series of cases in order to be able to you know, work up my caseload and, and show uh, my knowledge. And so I got in touch with the Kalamazoo County Medical Examiner's Office and said I needed some cases, and they were looking for a forensic dentist. So I've been working with them. That's, that is uh, a whole other side of it the is. It is. a whole different side, um, <laughs> and hopefully if everything goes well, come in February, I'll actually be board certified. If oh, I pass fantastic. my board, be board fantastic. certified. So and there's, I think... 
about 80 board certified, I think active board certified forensic dentists in the United States. Oh, wow. There's only one other in Michigan. So I'll be the second one here in Michigan. Wow, that's quite a, a distinction. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so fantastic. It's a lot of work, but it's very enjoyable. Yeah, and and, and you uh, have been telling us uh, when I was at your office and this evening earlier about the the work that you've been doing down in Guatemala, going on mission trips. And Correct. That's, yep. uh, thank you very much for you know taking the time out of your busy schedule to to give back like that. I yes. think that's really fantastic. Thank so. you. Thank you. I definitely feel I've been blessed to have the life I have, and I think we all are to live in the world we live in. And I always feel it's my responsibility to give back to others and that's just one way I, I take care of that. Well that's that's very commendable. So Thank we're you. we're proud to be able to uh, do what we can to help out. The hard work is always in your hands when you're down there in the It's the fun work though. <laughs> it's fun. Certainly I enjoy the it. rewarding part of that. Let's take a look at what we're going to be doing uh, this evening. Um, you've provided us with a list of some of the materials that you prefer when you're Correct. doing class twos. You run down through that yep. for us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about why you pick those materials? I think relatively, I mean, basically most dentists are to recognize these type of materials, very familiar with them. Um, I still do like to have a, almost a full etch on my preparations. Um, I learned a while back ago to use the chlorhexidine cavity cleanser. Um, some of the benefits of that is it helps to re-wet the tubules after you do the etching. It helps reduce post-op sensitivity and also you do get a little bit of an antimicrobial action to help disinfect things. Um, and since I've been using that in a combination with the Albon Universal, um, I've had very little post-op sensitivity on most of my preparations. Unless it's you know a bigger filling, we knew we we're closer to the nerve, some other things like that. But Certainly, I think that yeah. was a lot of uh, problems, a lot of earlier people using composites and posterior teeth were having issues with and you know people have been really working hard about reducing that sensitivity and that's what i found works in my hands you know just there's a lot of products out there they're all good i'm not saying these are you know by far any better than any others but this is what works in my hands what's worked well for me yeah. um i do like to use a sure fill by dense ply you do a nice bulk fill with that and it has very low um, polymerization shrinkage um, so you don't get the stresses built up with that However, it doesn't have as good of a wear characteristic to it, so that's why then I top that off with a Tetric Evo Ceram. Um, I just like how that handles it's a little bit thicker material. So when you when you uh, do that top layer, uh, you know how thick is that typically that you're laying on there? Typically, it's probably two to three millimeters out of the top layer. Okay, yep. so you're building up almost almost to the enamel, and then you're just capping. Right. Off. And the way I kind of look at it essentially is if the sure fill is going to be almost your dentin replacement, and then the Evo. Evo Ceram is going to be the enamel replacement. Okay, yeah, great. And now on the uh, on the uh, Surefill, are you doing anything there as far as uh, concerns about the shading of that? Or are you primarily achieving your shading through the? the uh, yes, I'm not concerned with the shading of the Surefill. Yeah, okay. there are some situations where I might have a core buildup, like we've lost the buckle portion of the tooth, and you will see a demarcation line between the two colors. But again, I know I'm going to be doing a crown or something further down okay. the road and just explain to the patient you're going to see some color variation. But never been an issue there. And then be replacing that. So. Yep. Okay, great. Well, um, if you have questions about any of those materials as we go through tonight, please sure to jot them down. Um, if, for instance, we cannot get to your question this evening, um, I will be sure to... Uh, answer via email and if it's something that I can answer I'll get with Dr. Draft or uh, one of our other clinicians to make sure that we can get your questions answered adequately. So um, let's take a look at our first case here this evening. Now this uh, particular case um, Dr. Robert Rosenfeld is a, a clinician who uh, has done some lecturing around the country and article writing and he was one of the first uh, people to receive the wide prep rings, and so he got real excited. I know you were doing some testing yes, of that, weren't you? that was you? part of the test market as well, too. Okay, yep. okay, fantastic. I think I didn't mention earlier, but Dr. Draft is part of, we, we call it our GAB, our Garrison Advisory Board, which are uh, local dentists who will come in a couple times a year and uh, help us in the early stages of product development, making sure that we're uh, you know, working on problems that are actually problems and not something that the marketing department made up. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure right. we're solving re real dental problems. And uh, he's part of that. And then, of course, uh, you know, gets his hands on a lot of the prototype stuff. So and this this one I put in here the, tonight because I think it uh, uh, is a, it's a fairly aggressive mm -hmm. wide prep. Um, you know, we're not going to get into talking about he's got some issues with the with the adjacent tooth Correct. and an old... Uh, uh, composite in there. Um, that's not our, our topic here this evening. Now this slide has the green Garrison wide prep ring uh, which is unique to the new Garrison fusion system. 
And this was one of the first cases, clinical cases that I've seen that came that came in. I mean, this was like days after we sent it to him. He, okay. he got this. He must have had somebody waiting in the chair for it. But um, I had a concern when I first saw this. I saw this slide, and the way that the uh, what is that the uh, the buckle side is, or is that the, yeah buckle mm -hmm. side of the matrix band looks like it, it extends into the prep a little bit. Looks like it's caved in just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and and you know I, without being able to ask Dr. Rosenfeld at the time, you know, was it what was the situation there? Um, I by looking at the next couple slides. You could see that I don't think he had it burnished yet. He hadn't right. kind of bloused that out to fill in that spot. But then he, uh, of course, did you that. You see the final right. restoration definitely is filled out there very nicely. Yeah, I think that really demonstrated, uh, you know, slide-wise in the clinical, um, what you can achieve. Now, before we jump into having having you do how, how your process okay. for a wide prep on the type, and I wanted to ask you, you know, when we're talking to folks about the wide prep ring, oftentimes they'll say, well, I'll just do a crown on that type of a, a situation. Why is it that you might recommend or, or offer as a treatment plan a direct composite on that size of a filling versus an indirect? I think there's definitely several reasons why we would have that situation. You know, sometimes we need to restore the tooth in order to just buy us more time until we can do a more definitive restoration. And we certainly want that restoration to be very functional for the patient. You know, don't want to have an open contact or a missing cusp, you know, so they continue to use that. You know, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is like an endo. You know, I've done a root canal, I've got a very large, you know, cavity or restoration, you know, and I can't do, I'm not going to do a crown right away. You know, I need to get that definitive restoration in there until we can get the, get the back for the crown. There are also, of course, people that have limited finances, you know, who can't afford the crowns, you know. There's times we're doing heroic dentistry um, where we have, you know, that's just a, not much left. That's a great statement, heroic yeah, dentistry. Heroic dentistry, yeah. you know, and you know, we know, hey, the restoration is not ideal. You know, we're, we're just trying to buy some more time for that patient with that tooth. You know, it's getting many more miles it can. Um, so I think there's a lot of times where I do these type of restorations, you know, hoping that we'll have more definitive, you know, a crown, what have you. But sometimes that's just the best you can do. Sure, yep. sure. That makes a lot of sense, so, you know, kind of taking the uh, a holistic approach about, you know, how can I best treat this patient yep. and not, uh, um, you know, worry about the other. Uh, yeah, you can't always put everybody into the cookie cutter program. You know, I have to have options. And that's right. the way when I, I guess treatment plan with my patients, I always like to give them those options. You know, hey, this is what I can do. This is what we have available. These are the costs associated with that. And I just help them make an informed decision. I think that's one of the, the better things. Dr. Draft's got, we've got a type of knot here, uh, a whole bucket full of garrison mm -hmm. materials All kinds of fun for him stuff. to demonstrate uh, how he would proceed with a, with a wide prep. On number three there, we have a restoration that's got a wide prep. And we also have the garrison box here that's got uh, lots of different choices for us. A couple of the key things that I look at, and so we're not going to talk a little about band selection. Um, there's some different ones we have here, but I'll just show you kind of with the one I like to use more commonly. You can see there. And this is one that does have the coating on it. Some of the other ones do come a little more pre-curved. It's one of the things I kind of wanted to point out. And you can see here, trying to show that around, this has a little more curvature to it. But if you do like the other ones, these ones I do kind of like to use, I will actually pre-curve these myself a little bit greater. Sure, sure. So, and I try and look at the tooth, if it's a premolar or if it's a molar, and so I'll be doing this ahead of time, just kind of giving that curvature, and just try and get form that to that tooth, and get that in there a little bit better. Now, yep. um, the, the band he grabbed was the, what we would call the standard band, standard right. molar band, so uh, I think it's about six millimeters tall. Um, Correct. Now, what do, now... What about depth of the prep? When you're when you're seeing a wide prep like that, um, how frequently is that going to extend subgingival? I would say a lot of times you have a wide enough preparation because you had a large enough cavity, it's going to go subgingival as well too. Okay. Yep. Yep. And I find these are the ones I use the most, the six millimeter tall ones, and I find that generally covers most of the ones I have. Um, do the ones with the extensions. You know, if I do have a little bit of a deeper one. Um, and they certainly work as 
just as equally as well too, but I find if you don't have that deep of a prep, you don't really need that, you're gonna have extra material certainly sitting above the margin of your tooth. Yeah, and that can in interfere. Too, yep. so, sure. Gets a little tougher. And the thing I want to point out too is when you place this band, you know, if you see here, if you see on the buckle side, if you see that well enough, you know, like to have that band kind of curve down into the gingival sulcus. You know, that tuck helps you get that down, exactly yeah. tuck it down in there. If it sits sticking out like that, it gets actually hung up on the gingiva and you can't get that interproximal down quite as tight. You know, certainly it's not as easy on the model here because the gingiva is pretty tight. The other trick I want to say too is I place these a lot with just my cotton pliers. Um, that's why I've gotten very used to using. Garrison mm -hmm. also does make a matrix placing instrument. Some people might use that as well too, where you actually can hold this from the occlusal aspect and place that posteriorly, get it back there without having to get your fingers down inside somebody's mouth too far. But the other trick I do sometimes to get these back here is I'll actually bend the corner. You see how well I can show that to you. I'll put a little bend sure. yeah, make on a, that make corner. Make a placement tab. Yep, make yep. my own little tab. Um, I just don't, me personally, I don't, pref don't like the ones on the occlusal little tabs. Those of you do, that's great. I hope they work very well for you, but this is what I just gotten accustomed to. So if I'm kind of looking in the patient's mouth, you know, try and imagine trying to get this back further in the patient's mouth, now I've got a little kind of corner I can grab and be able to place that in there. Um, some other tricks I do as well too is I often will use my finger up here as I'm going in there. Sometimes even my assistants, I have them trained quite well to be able to put their finger in there and help hold it in for me as well. And so then once I have that matrix band in place, if I got that little tab in there, you can just bend it back over and get it out of the way. And then go in there with your with your wedge. So a couple of different options here. Now, are, when you are restoring a wide prep like this, do you uh, do you specifically try to wedge from the side with the extension, or are you just looking for whatever's the most convenient? So a lot of times, what's most convenient for me? Okay. Yeah, that's with with the wedges. You know, choose the appropriate side so they go through and approximately quite well. You know, my thoughts are if you have a wedge, you can only stick in. You know that far, you're, 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 you're not getting the full benefit. Yeah. yeah, so you want to choose the appropriate wedge, and of course this I can be a little more, you know, aggressive on there, get that all the way through. But you want to get that full contact in there and get that whole marginal seal, and then you also got this sticking out on the lingual side to be able to help support it as well too. So I get very critical of choosing the appropriate size wedge, and that's why it's nice having the whole box and the different uh, wedge sizes you can have to your usage. Yep. So then once we have that in position. And it's just a relatively, I think, easy matter of loading in your composite tight. This is the wide prep one, again, the, the green one. And this is where, too, I also try and make sure that if you have one of the pre-curved ones or you've curved them, making sure they are curved That's around the prep as much really as you can. really good point, yeah. yeah. Keeping those out of the way. Those of you who have used them, you probably have had the same frustration I've had before, too, is you try and put the ring on here, and they're sticking out too far, and it grabs it, and it starts to shift it around. You know, so that just gets very frustrating for you and also the patient who are fumbling in their mouth. So just be able to get that out there wide enough and be able to get that locked down. So that makes it a lot easier. Okay. And that's also too sometimes where I'll even still have my finger here as I'm doing that. Or I have my assistant sometimes will place her finger too. And it takes very good coordination between you, know, you and your assistant to be able to help out with these. So there you go. Okay. Now, when, you, when you've got it at this stage and you haven't uh, applied, you know, any uh, at your bond or any of that, are you, uh, why would I say, burnishing yes. it a little bit or are you doing anything yeah. to, to further shape that? I do. Band? And even all of them, even the more conservative ones, I always will burnish it with an instrument. Um, this is a particular instrument here that Garrison does make. Um, I use have some of these, some other ones as well too. There's different angles on here, but I do like to take that instrument and burnish it up in there. You know, and I always like to make the, the contact pad a little bit wider. I feel like if I have a little extra material in there, I always go, go back in and trim that up. Um, sure. To me, it's sure. easier if you make the filling kind of too big, a little too bulky. And if it's too much, then go back and take it off. Whereas if you make it too conservative, you're going to have a hard time you know, adding material, of course. Now, do you, do you tend to uh, sculpt your marginal ridge in that last increment, or do you typically come back and, and do it with rotary instrumentation? I tend to do it more with rotary instrumentation. Okay. Yeah, part of my thoughts are is the more I manipulate and play with the material and the preparation, the greater chances for contamination. Okay. You know, so I like okay. to get it filled up. I'll give sure. it a general shape. 
you know, so I don't have a whole lot. I'm not going to make a big mound of a ugly tooth, so to speak. But right. I'll definitely try and get enough general shape that I can go back there. Um, probably one of the last things I will do is kind of use kind of like the flat end of the instruments and kind of form that marginal ridge just a little okay, bit. Sure, you know, I sure, do. Yeah. I do like to use the acorn side. I don't know what everybody else calls that, but I call it the acorn side. Yep. Um, so use the acorn side to give that occlusal anatomy, just kind of get a rough anatomy. And then I'll use the flat side then to go in there and just kind of shape that marginal ridge. That's probably about all the uh, occlusal work I do. Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. Let's take a look at some uh, some really complicated use of yes, sectional matrices. Yes, the bottom, bottom right one, that's definitely very complicated. Yeah, yeah. That, that is tough. Now, um, again, I, I grabbed these slides because this question comes up every single time we talk about sectional matrices. How do I do a back-to-back? -back? Yep. This is one way, certainly, Correct. to do it. Correct. And it wouldn't be my preferred way, just to say this. Um, I think sometimes in the sake of time, you know, it can be very convenient to really stack them up like this. But what I have found clinically is you still have a very hard time getting really good appropriate context. Okay, because when you guys look at the screen, the preps on the bottom right, you've got two retainer basically springs. You think about that's what they're doing. They're springing these teeth apart. And each time you put one of those springs on there, you're actually taking away a little more space. You know, so you're spreading that force out over greater teeth, and so you're not going to wind up, in my opinion, with this tight context when you're all said and done. Um, so in this situation, what I would typically do is I typically start with the most posterior tooth or the wider prep tooth. Okay. You know, so which one's going to be the biggest restoration going to be harder for me to clean up? You know, so I will probably, again, overfill that one, make it a little bulky. So in this case, that most posterior tooth, that MO restoration there, I would do that by itself, over bulk it probably into the distal, the tooth in front of it. Sure. Then I go back afterwards with my carbide instruments. It's tidy exposed. though. Yeah. yeah expose yeah. it. I would make that contact as beautiful, as perfect as I could. Um, especially if it's a deeper margin, you really got great access to go in there and clean that up. And then I would then build the tooth in front of it, do the MOD, and now use the Garrison Capazzi tights to be able to make that contact basically perfect. Okay. Be able to get those two together. Yeah, that, that I would say is... Uh, is what I would class as the more conservative approach to that. Um, the, the definitely the um, your likelihood of success is going to be a lot yep. greater. Um, it can be done the way that uh, that we have on the screen right now, but you know you can see I think there's some interest in, interestic yep. uh, challenges to doing that. I just did want to mention that that funny looking ring with the white tips on it that was an early prototype actually of the green ring, what eventually became the green ring. So you can kind of see how that uh, changes over time. Uh, well, the next case I think demonstrates what Dr. Draft was talking about specifically, about working the entire quadrant uh, in a conservative fashion to hopefully uh, have a greater likelihood of, of the outcome that you're really trying to get here. So, so let's take a look at what Dr. Malone here did. Uh, Dr. Malone, you may recognize that name. He is a uh, lecturing dentist, uh, uh, does a lot of writing and, and traveling around the world uh, on all different topics, and he was kind enough to send us this case. This is an interesting thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and I didn't know when I first got this mm -hmm. slide why he was doing all the preps <laughs> with, right. the, with the wedge in place. And then I, I watched a, a webinar from Dr. Mark Cannon, who's a renowned uh, pedodontist out of Chicago. And uh, during that webinar, he was showing a very similar case uh, on a pediatric patient and explained why. And he had those in there to protect the gingiva mm -hmm. and to start get getting some of the separation to, to really help get those tight contacts. And I thought, you know, that really made a lot of sense to me. Yep. So. Yeah, you explained this to me. We were talking about this earlier um, in my office. And again, it made sense to me to explain it to me. I never really had seen this myself either. Um, and also, too, that this situation with the rubber dam helps keep your rubber dam also compressed down so you don't nick that and yeah. mess up the rubber dam, have to replace the entire rubber dam. So Yeah, you don't yeah. lose your isolation. That way, and, and the wedges are easily replaceable. I mean, that's really not terribly expensive. So yeah, yeah, certainly. If you're gonna if you're gonna tear something up, that's what you want to tear yep. up. And now, as I'm understanding it, Doctor Draft, this is how you would tackle 
this case, correct? Can you talk us through that a little bit? Correct. It almost looks like on the posterior teeth, he's actually prepping them for some crowns. Yeah, I believe, he, right? he does, yeah, does some yeah. on the back. Yeah, that's what so. I was thinking. So, yeah, in this situation, you know, he's, he's got, you know, some of them separated. So he's working on all, looks like the distals of, of the restorations. We'll do those up incrementally and then maybe then switch over to the measles. Um, I don't know if I would quite do it that way. I would probably tend to do, you know, the entire restoration MOD, like I see in the premolars there all at one time and do each tooth individually. But I'm just, I'm just judging by the picture there. It looks like he's almost doing all the distals at one time, at least the way that's set up. Yeah, let's take a look at the next yeah, one. See what's and next. There he goes and yeah. does the measles. <laughs> does the measles. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. again what, another great way to to manage the stresses that you're applying and trying to get the separation. Then of course to spring back so you get those tight positive contacts when you're all finished. But I think the same idea. Great. Yeah. Now he does have one of the rings placed in a position that. Uh, can be a bit right. of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> backwards. It is backwards. If yeah. somebody has a big enough mouth, I mean, we've, yeah, we've I, got those patients, you know. I, I joke sometimes I can see patient stomachs, I think sometimes <laughs> their mouths can open up so big. Other times, you know, that they can barely open. Easier, it? I wonder how they get food in their mouth. You know, they say, you ask them to open up their mouth, and it's like open, you know, like, a centimeter is like, how do you eat? You know, yeah. can you open your mouth up more? Well, they like, don't eat corn on the cob. No, they, no, no. no. <laughs> but yes, it's there. I have done this sometimes, and that because the, the difficulty sometimes when you stack the rings, you know, especially on the premolars, you know, and um, we can show in a little bit yeah. how we stack those. But sometimes the rings overlap themselves, and it can be difficult to get the uh, the base of the forcep instrument around to take those on and off. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we're definitely that's our our next step here. Let's take a look at his his. Uh, he's got it all. Yep, it's a nice context, yep. nice, nice anatomy, nice embrasure spaces, so it looks very nice. And like then, very typical of the restorations we can get with the Garrison products. And a really nice looking quadrant yep. of dentistry there, so yeah. And and without taking uh, a, a significant risk in having to redo, I mean, when when you're looking at this whole the whole quadrant, I mean that was that was a lot of dentistry going on. Yes, here. two Emax crowns. You know, the patient was uh, in the chair for a while, I'm Definitely. sure, with all of that. And yep. to not have to go back and re-prep to get a tighter contact on something that you weren't happy with, yep. that saved everybody a lot of time it and does. money. It does. Yeah, so. I would say I very rarely do I have a situation using the Garrison products that I have to go back and add to a contact or redo a contact. So. Yeah, especially when used appropriately, of course. It's just looking at the, yeah, the two here between the molars here. I just want to kind of demonstrate a little bit. Um, the other thing I know that I like to really pay attention to is when I do my preparations, and make sure that's on the screen for everybody there, you know, is you do need to break that contact to some degree on the buccal and the lingual. If that, if that is too tight, you made it with any matrix system, it's hard to get this in between. Um, you know, if I really want to be super conservative, sometimes I do pre-wedge. You know, if I have a really tight one or just a particular situation, you know, I will sometimes get that wedge in there, let that sit for a little bit. Um, and that will give us a little bit more space in there, um, especially when you're doing back-to-back -back sometimes. Um, the difficulty there is now you've got your wedge in the way, and so you can't always seat the matrix band all the way down to the margin that you would like. And it's getting in the way there right there, but I got it in there. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll get you know one in and then get the other one back on the other side of it. Let me grab one. Make sure I'm keeping it in the camera there, right? Absolutely. So I'll get those lined up, and then what you can do is then you can pull that wedge out and then hopefully you still have enough to be able to pass it, passive amount to be able to get that down in there, get those seated. So that is one little trick sometimes to be able to get some tight contacts. But I say generally most of the time I've prepped that. I like to use a flame burr, uh, go over those margins, just kind of kind of take off some of those little rough spots, little mm -hmm. edges to be able to have enough, yeah, uh, enough room catch, to get in there. Uh, they'll catch that band and make it hard to Yeah, place. and once you get it bent up, then it gets hard. Then it gets hard to undo it. So, so that's how I would do kind of just some back to back. Should get those in there first. And again, I know I'm working backwards. Um, my hand is in the patient's throat right now. So, um, but it's just the way we're doing it here on the tabletop. But you get that in position. And that's a relatively easy one to do. And if we put our spring in there, just those simple back to back ones, because you're only going to use one retainer here and get that in position. I guess see how that one popped up a little bit. So I probably don't know if you can see well on the screen how that one just popped up a little bit, just putting that down. That's where again I'll put my finger on there, put a little positive pressure, and be able to hold those matrix bands in place and be able to seat the ring. Now you see because of that I did distort the occlusal surfaces of some of those bands, that's where you go back and you just burnish those, kind of bend them back, get them back in the right shape, get those contacts in a nice position. Now are you working uh, with magnification? Yes sir, I do. Okay. Yep. And then um when you're when you've got the bands in place, you've got it wedged, you've got the ring on there. 
Um, are you taking a peek down in there, maybe with an explorer sometimes, just to make sure you've yep. got that bottom? I definitely do. Up? I definitely do. And that's why the instrument, I, I brought one of my own instruments I like as well, too. I like the angle of this one because actually I can go down and I can feel that margin. Oh, sure. So sometimes if I think that my matrix band has got stuck above the margin or I got hung up somewhere, I can go in there and actually can kind of mold that in there. Um, usually I'll do that before I have the actual um, wedge in there, but be able to move that back down, especially in the deeper ones. So that's just the way I like. I know that I have a, a wards carver. It has different names people use for different things too, but um, different instruments. I just like that angle. So if you imagine this is in you know somebody's mouth and coming back here, getting down in that little area and just kind of making sure I've got that seated down and get a good marginal seal. Okay, so yep. let's do one where uh, you're stacking the rings because you yes. mentioned a couple things about some concerns occasionally about stacking. Yep. So. So let's say if we did have a reason we wanted to fix both of these teeth at the same time, and I'll just put this one back in here. So we got the mesial on the tooth. We'll get a little wedge in there. Get that seated. And so now if you want to try and restore these at the same time, you guys have some of the other bands as well here too. Yeah. Get these guys out. Yeah. Yeah, these two are, I think are very, very yeah, similar, but the, yep, yeah, the newer the, the newer the style. One, yeah. And so we want to certainly put it on the mesial, most mesial restoration first, okay? And then if we take the next one, you guys see that over well enough, okay? And then getting this over here. And this one isn't as bad because we've got a premolar and a molar. Okay, so you see we've got the space there in between those two rings. Oh, yeah. You know, to I grab those. I think what you're referring to earlier, if you want to put the instrument yep. back in there, I'll play a system here, yep. is this space right in Correct. here can get kind of tight. Okay, very tight. Yep. Yeah. So if we were to take yep. these off, and let's just we move it forward, even though I don't have any matrix bands in here, let's go, for instance, we went up here. And that's where these blue ones were great between the canine and the premolar. That's where the older style used to have a hard time getting grip in there. Yeah, these work really up. good. Yeah, I really love these, these styles here. So now if you go to place this over here, you know, it gets a little tighter yet. And you see not as much space we're talking right where those forceps are sitting in there. Yeah, and you can see here um, is a good example of you would not be able to do use the wide prep right. ring in either one of those positions because there just isn't the room just not a space. to yep. facilitate it. So. Yep. so that's where in the premolars yeah. you tend to run out of room a little faster, especially yeah. people who have smaller teeth. I mean, this isn't too bad situation here, but um, I think the design where you guys you know put the angles on these rings, it's a little bit better for those stacking situations, whereas some of the older ones... They're a little flatter. Yeah. A little flatter and just kind of put a couple of these on here, and that's where I found sometimes here. Now you see... See oh, how my right, forceps yeah, is right over that. Right here, yep. the forceps is in contact with the ring on the bottom. Yep. And, yep. Yeah. and that's where it can get tough. You know, placing them always is bad because it'll they'll snap in and then it'll pop down. But now we've got these real super tight, sometimes trying to get those forceps back into those little rings and be able to grab them and get them back out. So that's where, again, I think the improved design on having the 90-degree angles and the band out there gives you that little extra space. Okay. Yep, so that has helped. Fantastic. Yep. So again, just you know, a couple of tidbits again, just when you're, you're placing those, again, I always like to put my finger on top, or my, or my assistant's finger, just help hold those in position. And that just really, I think, makes everything nice and easy there. Now we yeah. have EFTA to some extent here in Michigan, correct? Where they've got some expanded duties yes. and they can, they can do certain parts of this. Yep, yep. Um, yep. so in my situation, um, if I'm, you know, it's chair side and I have the time, I place the matrix band, you know, I say majority of time, if I'm going to go do a hygiene exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I have a reason I have the preparation all done and completed, then I will instruct my assistant to place the matrix band, and then it's all ready when I come back. Okay. Yep. Now, yep. In Michigan, we can't, they can't do the bonding or any of that kind of stuff. Right. right. They can just place and then remove. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. And they can do polishing, I believe, the registered. Okay. Right? I have to double check on that. I don't, I don't have um, any of my assistants do that, but okay. I think, yeah. Well, that's the fun part. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> well, I like the artistry. That's where you mean. Exactly. You get, to, you get to pretty it all up right, and make you know. it all shiny. Now, when, do you put any kind of a, a sealer or anything over top or, or uh, tell us a little bit about it? I, no, I don't. Um, I've found, I guess, with the system that composites I use, I haven't found a need for that. Okay. Um, I just make sure I do a really nice polish, of course. You know, use all the carbide, the 12 fluid carbides. Um, I use enhanced cups. I like to use those a lot for polishing okay. as well, too. Okay. Yep. And do you take it all the way to um, um, 
where you would use like the their optimum high shine, or do you do you stop someplace in between if it's posterior? I mean, are you? I are do all of them. You taking you're polishing them out. All I do time? interiors a lot, a lot more, okay. put a lot more effort in the shining the interiors. Okay. Yeah, and the posteriors. You know, I just get them comfortable for their tongue. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. You know, I'll advise patients who might feel a little texture with a new restoration, but you know, after several meal stuff, they polish themselves up enough anyway. Okay. So that's, 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 that's my a nice thought. time saving. <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, I just yeah. you know, I make sure it's good, it's smooth. You know, it's, it's very functional. Yeah, you just, yeah, as long as the chewing gum doesn't stick to it, they're good to go. Yep, they're happy. So, yep. All right. All right. Have you ever seen a product that has two matrices joined, welded, uh, to do back-to-back -back restorations? I can't say I have. Well, have I you? tell you, I've, I've seen literally every matrix system ever produced in the last 25 years, and many of them that never made it to market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things that never made it to market was a welded together back-to-back -back band. Um, first of all, uh, you're, you're making something that is virtually impossible to place unless the buccal and lingual margins of both teeth are completely blown out. Right. You just can't get the band in there. Um, there's a product that I saw. It used to be only uh, overseas, but I have seen it here at uh, Wasserman, it's a W-A-S-S-E-R-M-A-N. Um, this contraption spring-loaded doohickey, it's really okay. hard to describe, that had the, the bands attached to it and um, uh, they were flat. They didn't, uh, uh, it wasn't providing any separation. It also wasn't providing any contour for that interproximal space. So I've not yeah. seen anything that has... Uh, been worth a try. Right, right. In general, how tight should wedges be placed? Is it better if they're pushed in really hard? Yeah, I certainly don't apply enough pressure that I want to you know, make the patient terribly uncomfortable, even though when they're anesthetized properly, you still feel that pressure. But I do want a pretty good seal and get a, a pretty good distance you know, as much as I can. Um, so it's kind of finding that happy medium. I've always found I like to err on the side of making the t contact too tight. So if it's too tight, I always can go back in there with finishing strips, other instruments, and be able to loosen that back up. And if you make it too loose, then you're going back in there, possibly removing your restoration and having to redo it. So, again, if, if I would say I always err in the side and make it by a little too tight, making you know tight enough contacts, um, then you can go back and adjust accordingly. I think I have one of these as a prep. When you wedge really, really hard and then burnish aggressively... Right, you get an overhang. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, that's yeah. got to be careful if, yeah, when you're burnishing in that, if you get a big bulky cervical margin down there. Yep, right. Yep. Very good point. Thank you. Do you allow your contact, for example, the entire CL2 box to be made out of Surefill SDR, or do you run the Evo Saran in that area too? So, I will ha allow the entire cervical area to be the, the Surefill. Yep. I think that's, if that answers that question appropriately. So if you look at this, let's say the preparation, for instance, here, if you imagine this was, you can see there, there you go. You know, so where I line my instrument on here, you know, so probably the, the bottom, at least, you know, third half of that would be entirely the sure fill and then the top, because that's not getting any clues away, of course, because it's between the teeth, and I feel like you get very good restorations that way. I really like, because the, the sure fill really flows in all the nooks and crannies, you know, I've seen less marginal leakage on the radiographs down, the, you know, as time has gone by. Um, it's one of, I'm not sure how many years I've been using that product, but I've certainly been using it long enough to really see, you know, the product being in use in patient's mouth, and I've really seen my restorations hold up very well in the cervical margins. Once you've got the class two is filled and you're starting to do your trimming, mm -hmm. you're going to start with carbides and, and you probably have maybe two at the most or three shapes that you right. use. What would yep. those shapes be? Yep. Um, you know, typically, I guess the way I was taught in school and I like to follow, you know, form follows function. So one of the first things I do is establish my occlusion. You know, I'm not too worried about the, the margins, you know, any flashes kind of things. I want to get that occlusion kind of dialed in first. So I get a general bulk shape. I use kind of a, just a large, I think it's a number four round burr. Okay. That's what I use. Sure. So I just kind of get that general shape, refine the occlusion. And then once I have that in position, checking your excursions, interferences, all those kind of things, and then I'll start doing the finer details of shaping the rest of the restoration. Um, then I just use a fine fluted, usually a, a gold, I call it a flame burr, fine, a fine okay. fluted flame burr, to go around those buckle margins, go in approximately, um, and clean up any flash that might exist out there. Okay. Yep. Great. 
Have you used the Compositite 3D Clear, and if so, are able to get tight contacts as these are slightly thicker? I have not. We talked about that a little yeah. bit earlier. Yes, no, I have not used the Clear. Um, and they even, you know, Kevin said that it was a product that doesn't, uh, doesn't sell the best, I guess you would say. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not quite as uh, popular. I, th I think there are occasions where it can be beneficial, like if you are doing like... Uh, the Sonic Fill? Yeah, the Sonic, Sonic Fill, fill. Yes. When yep. you're doing big bulk fill and you want to get a little bit of uh, uh, transenamel curing mm -hmm. from the buccal and lingual, that would facilitate it. Um, the bands are thicker. They're they're uh, you know fifty sixty percent thicker. Um, they are less burnishable because they it's mm -hmm. a mylar. It's a polyester. Yep. And without taking that out of the mouth and, and putting it on like a soft substrate and stretching it with like a ball burnisher. It's it's going to be the shape that it is when you pull it yeah. out of the out of the box. And that's why I also like I would say the the bulk fill restoration material too because you get a greater depth of cure without you know risking you know, the more polymerization shrink is, is what I want to say. Um, and I say if you're using those products, you know they always tell you to we recommend to take your light and see how far you're you're curing. You know check it you know on a extracted tooth or on a type of tooth and see your depth of cure. But you're able to get down there further. Um, I will sometimes, if I have a deeper, maybe wider uh, restoration after I take the matrix band off, we will go back and do some more light. If I want to make okay. sure, you know, say, hey, if I'm concerned, maybe I didn't get the light in there as deep or some particular angle. Um, I think we've all had it where you're taking a matrix band off and you're starting to shape it you know, with your carbide burrs and all saying, well, that feels a little soft. Maybe I didn't get a full cure there. Mm -hmm. You just go back there with the light. So um, I guess I've trained myself and my staff. If I know I have a bigger, deeper restoration, after I take that band off, we go back and we just shine an extra light. You know, it just takes you a couple, another 10, 30 seconds, whatever yeah. you want to do. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take much time. Just Pretty to make small sure. insurance policy yeah. there. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Right. How do you lighten a contact that shreds floss with back-to-back -back resins? Yes, uh, I don't have any. Do you have something, Kevin? Oh, um, my goodness. Do we have something? They've got stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got several different. Um, I have, like, a, a, a finishing strip. Let me just get in the box out here. Um, the one that's actually a little end cutting. I call it, kind of call it my little saw blade. Yep, that's the gray one, is yep. the saw. So you guys can see, get that on there. So that if you have a really tight contact and you really aren't getting floss in, you can use that. Um, it's also good for uh, removing um, you know, cement on restorations, crowns kind of things as well too. So once you have that opened up, then they have different uh, grits here basically. This is the super fine. So you can see it's a little perforated, there you go, a little perforated sander. So basically you just hold this Get on the model here into your fingers and just kind of go down in between the contacts and turn that up there and you just kind of go in there and lighten that up. So they have different uh, grits. They have what, fine, super fine, fine, medium, and coarse. Yep. Single sided and double sided yep. on that. So, on the, you know, if you're doing a, a, a back to back um, and, it, and it's too tight, oh, hallelujah. Yep. Um, but, <laughs> exactly. I'd rather what a have, problem to have. I'd rather right? have that problem than yeah. it being too, too loose. Correct. And, and I would say on, on those, you probably want to use the single sided one. Still, just use the single sided. Don't try to get in there with the double sided. Yep. You, may, you may remove a little more than what right. you want. So. Usually, do a little bit, check with the floss, and adjust from there. How long do you tell patients that large posterior composites might last? That's a tough question always, you know, because what are their chewing habits? If you've got somebody who's a bruxer, or you've got somebody who likes to chomp on ice, you know, or hard nuts and candies, you know, those kind of things. Um, yeah, so I really don't say there's one answer I can give, you know, just really is case dependent, you know, patient dependent. How do you get those matrix bands very subgingival without having them fold? with a very deep cavity. And I've, I guess personally, I haven't had a huge issue with that. I think usually they're, they're stiff enough in the way they're curved, but if you are, um, you know, one I would say is again, is I like to use my little flame burr um, and I always make that, that gingival margin have a little angle on it. You know, so if you have a 90 degree angle, and I think it's actually better in my mind for a seal for the restoration anyways too. So imagine this is my flame burr. I always kind of go around those margins and just add a little angle, a little bevel on those margins. And that way, too, when you place your matrix band down in there, you're not going to hit that 90-degree angle. You have a little margin to be able to slide down onto. It allows it to slide yep. past. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and then also, too, that's why I take you know this instrument of getting, getting hung up in there, kind of push that down and get down in, in there. You know, If you have a deeper margin, you do have some gingiva in the way. Um, if you have access to a soft tissue laser, um, I have a diode laser I will occasionally use as well, too. A little bit bulky tissue, especially if somebody's got some periodontal problems, you need to yeah. clean up some tissue. Yeah, you know they're already anesthetized. Get in there, and that's just pretty easy to use to make a little more space for the matrix band too. Yeah, that was uh, um, 
in our Ask Garrison segment, somebody had submitted a question ahead of time about how deep is too deep. Right. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, and I talked to a couple different doctors on that, and they were saying, you know, as long as it's not involving the bone, you know, right. you can you can you can restore it. You mm-hmm. may have to start off with, um, oh, the material that's got the fluoride release in it that self bonds to the like a glass ionomer. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally drawing a blank on that glass ionomer when it's really deep like that to uh, build it up a little bit right. so that that you. Can I think it. it's it's again patient dependent, and we always you know treat our patients. You know, if I have a patient who says ninety years old. And I've got a really large, deep cavity. I'm just happy I get a filling in there that's going to last them you know, the rest of what life they have. I mean, I hate right. to think of that way, but that's yeah. the reality of it. Whereas I have somebody who's 20, 30 years old and i got a deep restoration, then we're going to start talking crown lengthening. What are the things that we can do to maximize the life of that tooth? So, Any issues with C-Factor using Surefill? I have not. The C-Factor, I'm aware of that. Um, when they, uh, yeah, the C-Factor being... Uh, they ask the, sh- the shrinkage, right? Um, and I've seen lots of uh, done gobs and gobs of hands-on clinics around the country, and you see a lot of diagrams where the clinician is building up, right, at angles, right. You know, gotcha. using, yep. using angles that. so that yep. you're only ever pulling on two surfaces at one time, right. And, and right. I, I don't know what the shrinkage ratio is. It sure filled it. I'll tell the head. I don't. Really yeah. You know, again, issue. I. I have very minimal post-op sensitivity or see any of the white lines along the margins. You know, so there's a lot of factors that you know, I look for to make sure my products are handling the well the way I want them to. And again, in my hands, these products have worked well, and I've been very happy with and them. And how, how, for sure, Phil itself, how long have you been using that particular material? You mentioned earlier that you're seeing these yes. patients over and over again. Yeah. You've got some um, track record. I can't remember how long sure has been out, but I want to say off the top of my head it's been greater than, you know, five, six, seven years. I don't remember where it came out, but I think it's been quite some time. Okay. Long enough to see him come back quite a bit. Do you cure the Surefill layer prior to adding the layer of Evo Sodium? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, and sometimes even if it's deeper, even though I know the depth of cure to be greater, I still will do a couple layers of Surefill. Uh, just like with endo access, those kind of things. So you know, there's no harm in building it a couple layers, even though we have you know bulk fill of restoration composite material. Do you find um, round burrs, if round burrs concave the surface? I, I would, and that's I use those round burrs in the situation where I want a concave surface. So if I'm look, working on the occlusal anatomy, getting those grooves in there, that's where I would use that type of burr. So right down in the center. Right in the center of the groove where area. I want a concave surface, yes. Yeah. What would you use for a matrix for a small distal canine prep where a band covers access to the prep when the ring is placed? Yep, those I typically use a mylar band, a clear mylar band strip, and that's where I think the clear strips that Garrison has would be something to use there. But yeah, you know, canines like that, you unless you really have an occlusal access to be able to get in there, you really can't use the, the Garrison bands. What do you do if the band is stuck to the restoration because the contact is too tight? We talked about that before a little bit too um, before we started the, the webinar. Um, in my situation, you know, say if I had taken this off here. And let's say if that was stuck on there, I typically will have an explorer. I'll just demonstrate with this instrument. So if the, the lingual and buccal basically extensions of that band are glued in there and we've got a really tight one, what I'll do is I actually will peel those off first. So I'll get separation. So you want to get rid of that friction. So basically if that material is adhered to your band, you've got that mechanical French friction holding that in there. So you want to break that free, pull that forward. And then once I have that broken free, again, I'll use an explorer, even kind of go along the occlusal margin, just try and break free as much of that friction and that grip I can. And typically once I've done that, and then just a couple little tugs, i got the wedge in here, of course, holding it in, but a couple little tugs in there, and actually typically it will come free. Um, some instances this, you need to get some floss. Um, you talked about a case where a doctor had called where they actually ripped the buckle and the lingual off and had a piece of the matrix band still stuck in approximately. Um, now that happens to you, I think, unfortunately, you're just up the creek and might have to yeah. take that restoration out and replace it. Yeah, if you've got like a little uh, mosquito hemostat, um, you know, I think the, the big caution is to grip as much of the band as possible yep. before you start tugging on it so you don't rip little chunks off. Um, the band instrument that comes with a lot of our kits nowadays. Let me get this in the frame. There you go. This little tip on here has carbide teeth, interdigitating carbide teeth, and you can pull a matrix band right out of a pair of locking hemostats with that. <laughs> if you can't get it out with that, yep. it's not going to come out. 
And that's, I typically will use a locking pair to, yeah. for my removals, not the cotton fingers. I'll use that to place it on the cotton pliers there, but I usually use a locking to take them back yeah. out. Yep. Something with some good grip to it. Yep. What technique do you use to restore distal restoration on last molars without any distal contact and make sure there's no flash? I typically use a 2 by 4 as my wedge against the back of their throat. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, actually that situation is I had to use the standard Toffamere uh, matrix band. You have no other distal... Distal restoration, distal tooth. You just have to use a regular old band. Yep. Yep. That would be the same if you had a missing, uh, missing adjacent tooth. Any any time where there's there's no reason for contact, there's probably not a reason to worry. You, you know, you've you've got access to it to adjust contour. You know, whatever yep. you can get in there with. And I'll say thank Dr. you as well, Kraft, too. Yes, yep. thank, thank you, you so Kevin. Much. I appreciate it. Of course, they um, can't see us shaking right, hands yes. here, but... <laughs> but uh, we wave hi to everybody. So um, thank you, everybody, listening. Um, and if you don't mind, I could give a little shout-out to some of my friends in Canada. Oh, absolutely. Got a couple of uh, friends in Canada listening as well tonight, too, so give a little shout-out to them. So appreciate that. Fantastic. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.